Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining uh, the webinar today. We are so excited um, that you're picking your lunch hour to um, take part in this informative webinar. Uh, my name is Micah Whitfield, and I am the Director of Programs here with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Coalition of Georgia. And um, the, this is a part of our webinar series. If um, this is the first time that you've joined us, we offer uh, bi-monthly webinars, and um, we'd love to have you on our email list if you um, have not joined already. Uh, that link there, um, you can sign up for our newsletter and updates for um, additional information on our, our webinars and join our newsletter as well. And if you're just interested in any of our other events, we also have a link listed there for um, some upcoming events which are now all virtual because of COVID-19. So I hope that you all are um, staying safe and um, enjoying the opportunity to learn while at home. So this webinar in particular was presented, is presented by, um, of course, Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies, as well as the Georgia Perinatal Association. GPA is a great partner of ours, and we are very excited um, to have them as a part of this webinar. Um, and so our presenter today is Heather Weirich, and um, she is going um, to present to us on late preterm infants. And I'm actually gonna let her um, introduce herself, but she is the neonatal outreach coordinator with Memorial Health uh, in Savannah. And Heather, I will let you take it from there. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Thanks, Micah, for letting me speak on this topic. Um, we are going to be talking about the late preterm infant. Um, <clears throat> and before I get started, just to give you a little bit about my background, I have been a neo nurse for right at 20 years. Um, I've done transport for many years, and over about the last three and a half years, I've done neonatal outreach, um, where I've gone out and taught um, in some of the rural community hospitals around our region. Um, so again, thanks for having me today. And again, we're gonna talk about the late preterm infant. Let's see if I can get my slide to progress. There we go. Okay, so these are the basic objectives for today. Um, we're going to define exactly what is a late preterm infant, and then we're going to spend most of today talking about risk factors associated with this population. And that is really the most important thing that you need to think about when you're taking care of these babies. They're at high risk, but you need to know what they're at high risk for so that you can stay on top of them, you can monitor them for potential problems, catch them early, treat them effectively, so that these babies can have the best long-term outcomes that they can. And we're also gonna talk about, you know, the parents. What do we need to tell the parents? How do we prepare for discharge? And what we can do as caregivers to best support our parents. One thing to think about, you know, we're very used to taking care of these babies. We take care of them all the time, but, they are at risk for things. Most of the time they're fine, but you need to be able to anticipate, like I said, the risk factors that you may run into taking care of them. Uh, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt you, Heather. Um, I did receive a few messages that some folks could not hear the speaker. If you could just um, put in the chat, if a couple of you could put in the chat if you're still experiencing that issue in terms of um, of hearing our speaker, or if you have any issues with the sound. Is this better? Can you hear me now? I can hear you fine, but, um, okay. So I've got a couple in that says they can hear. All, okay, okay. All, they said all good now. All right, so sorry about that. Okay. I'm having a little bit of problem progressing my slides on my end too. Sure, I'll do it for you. Okay, can you just do it for me? Yeah, no problem. Okay, all right, so this is the definition of a late preterm infant. This is what we're looking at. So these babies are 34 weeks to 36 and 6 seventh weeks. They weigh anywhere from around four and a half pounds to six pounds and prematurity, 
just so you know, is the second leading cause of death for infants in the United States. And the late preterm infant comprises 70% of all preterm births. So huge portion of the preterm babies that we care for all the time, whether we are in the newborn nursery or if we're in a, a neonatal unit, we are um, taking care of these babies a lot. Next. And then this is looking at the mortality rate um, of the late preterm baby versus the term. Um, if you've ever taken stable, you'll recognize this first one. They are three times higher. Um, they have a three times higher mortality rate in the first year of life as compared to a term baby. Um, so pretty significant. Also, they are six times as likely to die during the first week of life as opposed to a term baby. And they are twice as likely to die from SIDS. So pretty, you know, staggering mortality rates associated with this population. So again, that's why it's so important to know what you're taking care of so that hopefully you can prevent some of the negative outcomes that you can see in this population. Next. And then this is looking at what they're at risk for. This is basically my entire talk in one slide. So these are the six things that we're gonna kind of systematically work through and some of the complications related to each. And a lot of these kind of go hand in hand with one another. So your late preterm newborn is at risk for hypoglycemia, hypothermia, respiratory distress, poor feeding, hyperbilirubinemia, and neurological underdevelopment. One thing that I want you to notice is I kind of want you to look at those outside boxes and those long-term problems that you can see. So these babies, because of these risk factors, are more prone to have NICU admissions, poor breastfeeding outcomes, they have a longer length of stay, and they're more prone to have long-term cognitive problems. So what we do in those first couple of days of life caring for these babies can have a huge impact on their overall outcomes. Next. And we're going to talk about respiratory distress first. This is typically what you think about when you talk about caring for a preterm baby. Um, they are at risk. The late preterm infant is at risk because they have underdeveloped lungs. Their lungs are not fully developed. But something else that you need to do is you need to review your history and look for risk factors that are going to increase your baby's chances of having respiratory distress, whether it's on the maternal side or the neonatal side. So infection related to mom, chorioamnionitis, is going to set the baby up for an increased risk of having respiratory distress. Gestational diabetes is another one. And then operative delivery, particularly that's a C-section without the presence of labor. These babies um, are at risk for transient tachypnea of the newborn. And they're also at an increased risk for oxygen requirement and NICU admissions. So what happens is, is you have a mom come in, she has um, you know, a scheduled C-section or something's going on and the mama is not in labor. That's when you really need to worry about the baby having an increased risk for respiratory distress. The onset of labor itself starts a cascade of events that stops the production of fetal lung fluid and starts the absorption process. So that helps the baby be able to breathe better once they're born. So if you have a mama that has a C-section and she's not in labor, then the baby is more than likely going to have a lot more fetal lung fluid to deal with and absorb and can get into problems breathing related to that. And then you need to look at your mom's medications. Um, was she on mag sulfate? Did she go under general anesthesia? All of those things can compromise the baby's breathing once they're born. As far as the neonatal um, factors, you know, if you have to resuscitate a baby, the baby has low outguards, then that can affect transitioning. It can increase the chances for respiratory distress. And then also, if it is a male Caucasian baby, they're at an even increased risk for having respiratory distress once they're born. The lower the gestational age, the greater the chance of having respiratory distress. And I think we all know that, you know, even if you have a baby that is 36 and six weeks, compared to a 34-weeker, that 34-weeker is more than likely going to have respiratory distress as opposed to the older baby. Next. Now, there are some things that we can do to decrease respiratory distress in the late preterm infant, and I think we're, we know this stuff. We're very well-versed with these two. So if mom gets steroids during her pregnancy, or if you have a mama that has maternal hypertension, a lot of times that stress in utero will help the baby develop more and have a less chance of having respiratory distress once they're delivered. Next. 
So these are the basic causes. This is why we see an increase of respiratory distress in the late preterm infants. It basically has to do with their lungs are underdeveloped. That's one of the last things that develops um, in the baby. So if they're a couple weeks early, it can make a significant difference on the development of their lungs. So they have immature control of breathing. So what you'll see sometimes, you'll see in a greater increase or chance of the baby having apnea, tachypnea. They also are known to have lower surfactant levels. And then just because of their development and their immature lung development, um, they have less alveoli and they're typically smaller in size. Something else to think about with this population, the late preterm infant, is overall they have a higher incidence of respiratory distress syndrome. You know, that's associated with a surfactant deficiency. So what you see in these babies is you see an increased work of breathing and the late preterm infant may not need intubation and surfactant administration as frequently as some of your younger preterm babies, but they are at an increased risk for having mild respiratory distress where they have problems breathing, a NICU admission, and they may need some kind of respiratory modality that will su provide support. So depending on your institution, that could be a high flow nasal cannula. Most of the time we use CPAP or you could be in a facility that cannot provide that. And so this may be the point where your baby is gonna need to be transferred and you're gonna have to um, set up a neonatal transport and the baby is going to be separated from the mama. Next. So some clinical guidelines, these are A1 guidelines. First thing that you need to do is you need to have really good assessment skills with your babies. Um, this needs to start in the delivery room and it needs to be ongoing. So you don't transition, transition them, leave them with mom and then leave them be as much as you would a term baby. So you need to continually assess them, particularly for an increased work of breathing. So that is gonna look like um, respiratory distress. So you're gonna start to see signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. In a baby, you can see tachypnea, nasal flaring, retractions, and grunting. The more types of, and more signs and symptoms of respiratory distress that you see, typically the sicker your patient is. So you need to kind of keep all of that in mind when you're assessing your baby. You also need to maintain a normal temperature, so a neutral thermal environment. And we'll talk a lot about hypothermia next, but um, when you have a baby within a normal temperature range, you minimize their oxygen needs in the body. So you decrease the chances of respiratory distress in your patient if you can monitor them and keep their temperature normal. You also want to make sure that you do what you can to keep their stats between 90 to 95%. And that is after that first transitional 10 minutes of life. And if you're having problems, then you need to be able to provide the support that you need. So that could be, you know, simple nasal cannula, high flow, CPAP. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you heat and humidify any supplemental oxygen that you give to your babies. Now, a lot of times in the delivery room, we do not have that capability. So you want to make sure that you transfer them and get them to a heat and humidified source as soon as possible. Another thing that you wanna do with babies that are having respiratory distress is you wanna check their blood sugars. Anytime that you have respiratory distress or basically any kind of stress on the body, that's gonna increase your consumption of glucose and it's gonna increase your chances or the baby's chances of hypoglycemia. So check a blood sugar. And then you wanna consider transferring to a higher level of care. And that could be down the hallway to a NICU unit or you could be looking at an actual neonatal transport. Next. So we're gonna move right on into hypothermia. Um, some of the things that you can see on your history, now babies are gonna be at risk for hypothermia if they are late preterm infants on a good day. So there's some things that can exacerbate that. If mom has hypertension or substance abuse during her pregnancy, then that is gonna affect the growth of the baby. So you typically have a smaller baby um, that may not have the fat that a term baby does to maintain normal body temperature. And then on the neonatal side, um, risk factors can include lower APGAR scores. So any kind of need for resuscitation or illness or problems with the baby in the delivery room can set them up for an increased risk for hypothermia. Next. 
And these are the general causes, and this has to do, again, with the baby being a couple weeks preterm, so you have an immature epidural barrier. You also have decreased brown adipose tissue, and if you remember from stable, what happens in a term baby that has brown fat is they actually start burning and metabolizing that brown fat, and that helps heat the core of the body. So if you have a baby that has less brown fat, then they have less of that fat to help maintain that core body temperature that they need. They also have a higher ratio of surface area to body weight. They have immature um, temperature regulating mechanisms. So when the body gets cold or the baby's body gets cold, it sends the brain a uh, signal to release norepinephrine. And what that does is that, you know, causes vasoconstriction peripherally, keeps the, the blood in the core of the body, helps start burning that adipose or that brown adipose tissue. So if you're dealing with a baby that's not term, a lot of those regulating mechanisms are not present or don't work as effectively. And then just because they are preterm, they're more prone to having complications in the delivery room. Um, so, you know, you may be blowing cold oxygen on their face. You may not be focused as much on their temperature when you're trying to resuscitate them. So all of those things together set the baby up for having hypothermia related to them being a couple weeks preterm. Next. So these are the clinical guidelines. This is what they recommend is that you keep the baby's temperature between 97.7 to 99.5. Um, and again, you need to keep it between those brackets. Don't even let it get a little bit below that because that's gonna set that cascade of events and process where the body's gonna start trying to warm itself. Um, and you know a preterm baby has limited resources to do that. Plus it's gonna increase the oxygen requirement and glucose consumption just because of what the body has to do to try to warm itself. So really do your due diligence of keeping the baby's temperature between 97.7 and 99.5. In the delivery room, and we know this, we do this every day, you dry them immediately, you wanna get them skin to skin so that you can maintain a normal temperature. If you're having problems, then you may need to move them to a NICU where you can put them in an isolate or underneath a radiant warmer. And then the general recommendation is to postpone bathing these babies for at least four hours. Next. So this is cold stress. Um, we talk a lot about cold stress if you work in the NICU or babies. Um, it is something that you definitely need to prevent and you need to monitor your baby for. You can have some pretty significant complications and negative outcomes related to cold stress and you can prevent it just by maintaining a normal temperature. So if you have a baby that gets cold, what happens is, is they start to do a lot of things in their body to try to warm themselves. It increases their oxygen requirement. So it can throw a baby into respiratory distress where you see tachypnea, um, you can have circulatory changes, so pallor, cyanosis, modeling. Something else that it can do is it can alter pulmonary vasomotor tone. And so what happens after a baby is born is they have that normal transitioning where they start to dilate and fill their lungs up um, with air and blood flow starts to go out into their lungs to establish gas exchange. So if you have a baby that's cold, you may it may alter that normal transitioning that needs to happen so that the baby can effectively oxygenate themselves once they're born. Um, if they cannot effectively oxygenate themselves, then that can lead to metabolic acidosis, lethargy. And you can also see poor feeding in a baby that gets cold. All of these things are going to lead to hypoxia, hypoglycemia, and they can lead to a decreased surfactant production. So again, very significant problems that you can see in your baby just because they got cold. So you really need to focus on their temperature. You definitely need to focus on it if they're a late preterm infant. Next. So now we're going to talk about hypoglycemia. Um, we know that the late preterm infants have about a three-fold increase or incidence of hypoglycemia. A lot of these babies will end up requiring IV glucose in a NICU. Um, some things that you need to look at as far as your history that can exacerbate hypoglycemia in the late preterm infant is gestational or diabetes mellitus, particularly if mom has uncontrolled diabetes, preeclampsia, and that has to do with stress. 
um, the stress that the baby has in utero, if you will remember, um, babies form glucose and our store glucose in the form of glycogen stores so that they can ma maintain a normal blood sugar once they're born. So if they're stressed in utero, they're using everything that they can just to survive that's coming across the placenta as far as glucose. They don't have the extra to have the glycogen stores that they need once they're born. So stress is going to end up causing hypoglycemia, whether it's preeclampsia or if it is a difficult prolonged delivery or if you have an abnormal tracing during labor. So all of those things are indicators of stress in the baby, which can cause hypoglycemia. You can also see it with tocolytic use um, during or to prevent preterm labor. Next. So these are some other indicators. These are on the neonatal side. So IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction. Um, these babies are usually small for gestational age. Um, that is usually an indicator of some kind of stress in utero. So these babies are at an increased risk for having hypoglycemia. Twin gestation, um, if the baby has some kind of stress once they're born, so they have to resuscitate them, or they're septic, they have some kind of infection or respiratory distress then again, that is going to cause the baby to, to burn through their glucose, have increased glucose utilization, and can set them up for being profoundly hypoglycemic once they're born. Next. This is what hypoglycemia typically looks like in a baby. So you can see poor feeding. Um, you can see hypothermia, an abnormal cry. What we see most often are tremors, those fine tremors that you can see in the hands typically or jitteriness. Um, if it's low enough, you can see seizures in a baby. Um, you can see a change in the level of consciousness. It can affect their breathing, so you can start to see apnea, tachypnea, cyanosis. And then eye rolling may be an indicator if it is a repetitive motion, kind of a repetitive eye rolling. That may be an indicator of seizure activity in the neonate. So again, pretty significant complications from getting hypoglycemic. And what you need to realize is babies a lot of times are hypoglycemic and they're asymptomatic. So that's when you wanna catch it. You don't wanna catch hypoglycemia when they're starting to have jitteriness or it's progressing to seizures. You want to monitor the ones that are at risk for hypoglycemia. So today we're talking about the late preterm baby. So you need to know they're at risk so that you can monitor them more frequently so that you can catch the hypoglycemia before they're symptomatic. Next. So these are the clinical guidelines. Um, every hospital varies a little bit on you know, the numbers, how often you treat or screen for hypoglycemia. So it's important to know your hospital's protocol or policy so that you are doing what you're supposed to according to your hospital's guidelines. The general guidelines for the late preterm infant include screening the baby within the first two hours of life, also before feeding for the first 24 hours, and if they become symptomatic or they just start to display any symptoms that you worry may be related to hypoglycemia. You also need to start these babies feeding very early, within the first couple of hours of life if possible. And if you see any change in your patient, then you need to make sure that you screen the baby for hypoglycemia. So grab a blood sugar. And then if you're having any issues, you may need to go ahead and give them glucose gel or start them on IV therapy as needed according to your protocol for your hospital. Next. Another thing that we're gonna talk about is sepsis. And sepsis is bad in a term baby. So they are very limited to be able to effectively fight off infection, but you make them you take them back a couple weeks, they're that late preterm baby, then sepsis can be even more deadly in your late preterm baby. So you need to know which babies are at risk and look at your history. So some of the things that you can see on your history are prolonged rupture of membranes, particularly if they're greater than 18 hours. If you have a baby that's less than 37 weeks, which is what we're talking about today, so your preterm baby is automatically at risk. The late preterm baby in particular is at risk because they have an immature immune system. They also have impaired skin integrity. They're at an increased risk for having problems with breastfeeding, or mom may have a decreased milk supply, which will decrease that passive immunity 
that babies can get from breastfeeding. Something else that sets a baby up for sepsis is if you have GBS or the mom has GBS that's identified any time during pregnancy. And then young maternal age and then African-American babies are also more susceptible to sepsis. Next. And then these are the signs and symptoms. The thing about babies is they can be a little bit tricky. You gotta look for those subtle changes or indicators for sepsis. You wanna catch this early. So it's not gonna present the same way that you would see in an older patient, even an older child or an adult. Temp instability is the first one. So you have a baby that's trucking along, doing fine, maintaining its temperature, and then all of a sudden it starts to trend down. It's not, the baby's not maintaining its temperature like it was. That may be your first indicator of sepsis or infection. So you don't wanna ignore that. You can also see lethargy, hypertonia, um, respiratory distress is seen in majority of babies that have sepsis. Another thing that you can see is you can see profound hypotension related to sepsis in the newborn. And a lot of times these are the babies that end up on inotropes such as dopamine and dobutamine related to sepsis. So they can be very critically ill from sepsis. You can see changes in their circulatory system, so poor perfusion. You also can see, depending on what's going on, what kind of infection it is, you can see gastric distension, you can see vomiting, bloody stools. Again, sepsis puts a lot of extra stress on the body, so you have an increased glucose utilization, so you can have glucose instability or hypoglycemia. And then also another sign or symptom of sepsis in a neonate can be any kind of rash, pustule, or if your baby has petechiae. Next. So these are the recommendations. You want to do a septic workup if you suspect sepsis or even if the patient has any kind of clinical risk factors. You want to do a CBC blood culture. If you are having any kind of respiratory distress, you want to go ahead and get a chest x-ray. And then they recommend that the physician go ahead, goes ahead and does a lumbar puncture if sepsis is suspected. And the reason for that is, is we know that there is a pretty good correlation between sepsis and meningitis in the newborn period. So if we should suspect sepsis, the baby should be getting worked up for meningitis as well. And then antibiotic therapy, you want to get these started as soon as possible. So you're going to base your decision to start antibiotics or the physician is based on risk factors or your baby's clinical appearance. Um, so you're going to go ahead and start those. You can always stop them once the culture is negative. But if you have a baby that you are working up for sepsis, that you suspect sepsis for, and the physician has ordered antibiotics, it should be your number one priority to get those antibiotics started as soon as possible. Typically, these babies are sick. You're having to draw labs, start IVs, do all of those other things. But you need to really make it a priority to start the antibiotics absolutely as soon as you possibly can after you've drawn the cultures. Next. Another thing they're at risk for is jaundice. Um, they're also at risk for or jaundice or hyperbilirubinemia. So we know that most term babies, a lot of term babies will experience hyperbilirubinemia, um, but a late preterm baby is two times more likely to have hypobilirubinemia during that first week of life. And then of those babies, 50% will have clinically significant jaundice. So what that means is they will need treatment, particularly um, some kind of phototherapy. Next. And then these are the causes. Um, it has to do with physiological immaturity, particularly of the liver and the GI tract. Um, so what you'll see is you'll see an increased production. You can see a delayed conjugation. And that is related to the, um, the immature liver and gut. And then you, you know that babies that have, are late preterm babies, they have immature guts. So their guts are not going to function as effectively as even a term baby would, would. So you have decreased GI motility. A lot of times these babies don't eat very well. So what that's going to do is that's going to increase the gastric reabsorption of bilirubin in the blood. So all of those things working together sets a baby up that's a late preterm baby for having hyperbilirubinemia, um, even greater chance than you would see in term baby. Next. 
So these are the clinical guidelines. One of the things that's really important is you need to identify risk factors for severe hyperbilirubinemia. So what we're talking about here is you need to identify those babies that are at risk for particularly hemolytic anemia. So you can see that with your ABO incompatibility or you can see it with your RH factor where mom is negative, the baby is positive, their blood has mixed in utero, and then the mom will send antibodies across the placenta into the baby that will exacerbate, exacerbate the breakdown of red blood cells. So it sets the baby up for having that dangerously high bilirubin level. So you need to screen babies and go ahead and effectively treat them and identify them if they're at risk for hemolytic anemia. You also need to assess the quality and adequacy of breastfeeding. You need to be able to provide mom the support. You need to get the baby eating early. Um, if the baby is not effectively taking enough by mouth, you may have to supplement or tube feed a late preterm baby. And then you also want to assess for the presence of jaundice in the first 24 hours of life. So going back to that hemolytic anemia that I was talking about earlier, a lot of these babies that are exposed to antibodies, mom's antibodies in utero, they have an exacerbation of the breakdown of red blood cells, they'll present with hyperbilirubinemia in that first 24 hours of life. So that's that pathological jaundice that you can see in the newborn. And what that does is that sets the baby up to potentially having a very high level of bilirubin. All babies, bilirubin levels, most babies are kind of going to kind of trend up over the first couple of days of life and then go back down to normal limits. Well, if you have a baby that starts with really a really high bilirubin during the first 24 hours, then they're at risk for getting to those dangerously high levels at day two, three, four of life. So you want to draw um, a blood level. So that's a total, total serum bilirubin level. And then what the physician will do is they'll plot it on a nomogram. And the nomogram, it looks at how many hours old the baby is. And there's ones that are split up specifically for gestational age. So they'll plot the bilirubin level on the nomogram and that'll kind of help them decide if they need to start the baby on phototherapy. And then you always need to make sure that you continue to evaluate the bilirubin levels prior to discharge for the late preterm baby. And you may be having a situation where the baby is discharged and needs to have follow-up bilirubin levels at the pediatrician's office, or they can continue to have phototherapy once they're discharged. Next. So the last thing that I'm gonna talk about is they're, they're at an increased risk for having feeding challenges. And this is related to prematurity also. The younger they are, the increased chance that they're gonna have problems feeding. So typically, for example, a 36-weeker is gonna eat a lot better than say a 34 weeker. So the younger the baby is, the more problems they typically have. Um, they are at an increased risk for having challenges feeding if they are born by C-section. This separates the mom and the baby so it can delay that initial breastfeeding. But also statistically, um, mamas that have C-sections have a greater chance of having problems with milk supply. So late preterm babies, they don't eat as well, plus if they have these risk factors, then it's at an even increased risk for the baby to have feeding challenges. Next. These are the clinical guidelines. Skin to skin is very important for breastfeeding, so you wanna get that baby on the mom's chest as soon as possible. You wanna facilitate early breastfeeding, and then you wanna evaluate for readiness to feed. So you wanna look at those cues you want to be able to identify babies that are ready to feed, and what that looks like is rooting, good latch, but you also want to be able to identify babies in that late preterm infant population that are not ready to feed. What does that look like? So that they're uninterested, they're sleeping through their feed, they don't have a good latch. If they latch, it's not for a long period of time. So they, those babies may need to be tube fed instead of bottle fed. So you really need to assess them both ways. You need to look for problem feeding because you know that they're at an increased risk for that. You want to provide breastfeeding support to mom. So if mom and baby are separated, you need to get the mom pumping as soon as possible. The general guidelines are that you start a mom pumping within the first one to two hours of life. So very early. So if you have a mom that has a C-section and she's in recovery, then the recovery nurse 
or the postpartum nurse needs to come into the recovery room and get that mom set up and started pumping as soon as, soon as she can as early as possible. And then you want to supplement as needed. So if the baby's not taking enough, is not acting like they're ready to feed, then you're going to have to, or the breast milk supply is not in yet, then you may have to supplement or you may have to tube feed a late preterm baby. Next. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk a little bit about patient education and support or parent education and support. And how do we prepare these babies to go home? How do we make these parents successful once they do take these babies home? We need to talk to them about what they're at risk for. So hypothermia, and we spent some time talking about all the things that can happen from a baby getting cold, cold stress, hypoxia, um, hypoglycemia. So we need to talk to our parents about this and we need to teach them that it's very important that these babies maintain a neutral thermal environment once they go home. We also need to talk to them about how dangerous infection can be. Um, it's funny that we're talking about this because we're very, we talk all the time now about COVID guidelines and self, you know, social distancing and not being around large crowds. That's kind of what we're doing right now. But since I started in neonatal 20 years ago, we always taught parents that were taking home preterm babies that you need to social distance, make sure people wash their hands, that they use hand sanitizer, um, and that they avoid large crowds. So that never changes for the preterm baby. You always want to make sure that that's part of your discharge teaching for them. And, you know, what does a large crowd mean? Malls, churches, you need to just let them know that, you know, you need to let the baby get a little bit older or if it's right in the middle of flu and cold season, wait till we're past that before they take the baby out in public and they expose them to a lot of people just to prevent infection because we know it can be so dangerous in um, the newborn period. You also want to make sure that you help parents um, be successful at breastfeeding to su provide the support that they need. Teach parents feeding cues. Also, with the late preterm baby, you don't want to let them go an extended period of time without breastfeeding. So you may have to teach the mom that she needs to wake her baby up to feed them every three hours and not let them go four or five hours between feeding. So that's something that's a little bit different with a late preterm baby. You got to wake them up and make sure that they feed when they need to and as often as they need to. Next. So discharge planning, um, the general recommendation from A1 is that you do not discharge a baby be before 48 hours of life, and then they need to be able to prove that they can um, be stable. So they need to have a normal temperature, and their vital signs need to be within normal limits before they're discharged. And they need to have established successful feedings before they're discharged. Next. And then education is really important with this population. Um, some things that you really need to have good conversations with our parents about. Um, you need to talk to them about not exposing these babies to secondhand smoke. Um, late preterm babies are already more prone to respiratory illnesses, rehospitalization. They're twice as likely to die of SIDS. And secondhand smoke, we know the exposure of tobacco smoke increases respiratory illnesses, ear infections, hospitalizations, and the incident of SIDS. So we need to teach our parents, you know, if you are going to smoke, you don't need to smoke in a closed environment, say the house or the car. You need to be outside. And you probably need to get into a habit of changing your clothes before you hold your baby. Or give them, you know, ask them about stopping smoking and if you can provide them any information for that, that's always helpful. You also want to go over safe sleep recommendations. Um, they need to be on their backs when they go to sleep. They need to be monitored if they're on their stomachs. And then they do not need to sleep in the same bed or co-bed with an adult. You also want to make sure that you teach the parents that they don't need soft objects or loose bedding. You know, this baby, these babies are already at an increased risk for SIDS. So you want to make sure that you teach them safe sleep recommendations to decrease those chances of SIDS. Another thing that you need to teach parents is you need to teach them the signs of illness, when to call the pediatrician, 
So if the baby is running a temperature greater than 100.4, if they have any change then that the parents are concerned about, they can always call the pediatrician. If they start to have problems feeding, vomiting, if they start to have lethargy, or if they have any problems breathing, then in that situation, they need to be instructed to go ahead and call 911. Next. So this is the last thing that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about neurodevelopmental outcomes. We want to provide the best care that we can for these babies so that we can have the best outcomes. And what we do in those first couple of days of life, recognizing what babies are at risk for that are born in the late preterm period, addressing those, assessing those, catching them early before the babies are too compromised from whatever is going on with them will help improve their overall long-term outcome. So these are some statistics related to the late preterm baby. They are three times more likely to be diagnosed with cerebral palsy. They also have significant higher rates of developmental delays and mental retardation. And they're more likely to have a positive screening for autism. So again, very vulnerable population. We take care of them all the time. We're very used to them. Um, a lot of them do very well but some of them can have significant problems and they can have you know devastating outcomes long term so it's all about knowing your patient knowing what they're at risk for so that you can adequately screen and take care of those patients the best that we can so they do have those good long-term outcomes next So these are my resources. Um, there is a, A1 put out an assessment care of the late preterm infant um, in 2017. It's great, has a lot of this information, but I also use STABLE program and the perinatal um, continuing education program textbooks. Next. So that's gonna conclude um, my portion. If anybody has any questions, I also included my um, email at the bottom. If anybody wants a copy of my slides, just email me. I'll be glad to share them. And I'm going to turn it over to Micah to see if anybody has any questions for me. And thank you guys so much. Thank you, Heather. Um, very informative. Um, as Heather mentioned, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the um, uh, chat box and I will uh, share them with her. Um, and while you're doing that, I just um, wanted to mention, which I forgot um, in the beginning of our webinar, that this is um, this uh, webinar is approved for one CE through the Georgia Nurses Association. So um, after the webinar by Friday, I believe you'll receive um, an email uh, with a link um, to an evaluation to complete. Um, and uh, as well as Heather, if it's okay, I'll PDF the slides and send that with that as well. Um, sure. So you can, uh, perfect. So you can get the slides and then the evaluation. And once you complete the evaluation, give us about a week and then we typically will email you the certificates following that. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, one question. From Taryn, it says the baby needs to be monitored if sleeping on their stomach. What does this mean? So they need to be monitored. Tummy time needs to be monitored. You always want to make sure that the baby is on their back to sleep until they are able to turn by themselves from their tummies to their backs, back and forward, and they have good head control and they can turn their heads side to side. So if your baby cannot do that, then they don't need to be on their tummies when you're not sitting there monitoring. So you don't let them sleep on their tummies, you sleep them on their backs so they can again roll over or effectively turn their heads from side to side. All right. Um, next question, what are the reasons for the developmental delays in these babies? Um, well, it has to do, there's um, a lot of different reasons that, you know, it has to do with the increased risk factors for some complications early in life. So, um, you know, you have a baby that, you know, if they're very sick, they're, you know, intubated and they have sepsis, which there's an increased chance of that during the um, 
late preterm period, then those things can affect the long-term neurological outcomes of those babies. Perfect. All right, we've got a few more. Um, Taryn says, thank you for your clarification. Lisa says, I work with premature babies, but I've noticed that 40 weekers are having feeding issues and respiratory issues. Would this be a situation where you're looking at the maternal history? Is there anything to prevent this? That's a very broad general um, question. So if you have a baby that's having feeding issues, you always want to look at the history first to try to figure out. Um, you know, a lot of times you can, if they're preterm, you can explain it with that. But if it's a term baby, um, you need to look at what's going on, how was the pregnancy, how was the mom, you know, what was the delivery like, has the baby had any complications, um, you know, was mom gestational diabetes, was any of that going on, were there any risk factors um, which can affect or the baby or is mom, you know, effectively breastfeeding? So there's a lot of different factors. Term babies, you know, sometimes initially can have a little bit of a bumpy start, but they should be able to get it together within the first couple of days of life and start effectively feeding. So if they're not, then absolutely the first thing you want to do is go back and look at your maternal and your neonatal history to try to figure out, you know, where is this coming from and how you fix it in your patients. Okay. Um, and then another question from Julia says, do you send teaching papers home with parents and can you share them? I work with parents at home. We do send discharge pay, um, home. Yes, just email me and ask me what you, or let me know what you want and I'll be glad to share with you what I have. And we still have a few more minutes, so if you have a question um, that maybe has, hasn't been answered or just a comment, um, we have a few more minutes that you can um, put that there in the chat box. And while we're waiting on that, um, Heather, are there any other maybe resources or things, um, websites or um, anything that our audience members could benefit from around this topic? March of Dimes is always a good resource for parents. Um, you know, whether your baby, if, if I do have parents that are listening and your baby's in the NICU, they provide a lot of education um, to moms that are in the NICU, but they also have really good resources online. Um, they're kind of in the forefront of working hand to hand with our parents at the bedside if they do have a baby that's in the NICU or has had some kind of um, problems early. So I would definitely recommend either reaching out to the March of Dimes associate at, at the hospital where your baby is or looking at their online resources. Perfect. Thank you. Well, if there aren't any other questions, um, certainly um, Heather's email is listed there. So feel free to, um, Send her questions directly, or um, if something comes up, I'd be happy to forward them to her as well. Um, and thank you so much. We appreciate it. It was very informative, and um, I will be sure to send these slides out with our evaluation. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And um, we've had a few folks comment in the chat say thank you. So. Um, Awesome. Well, we um, hope you all have a great afternoon. And again, you know, look for that um, email by the end of the week. Thanks so much. Take care.